Good evening, everybody. Welcome to this Kennel Club webinar on the dangers of breeding for fashionable colours with a particular focus on colour dilution alopecia. Uh, my name is Ian Seath. I'm chairman of the Kennel Club's Breed Standards and Confirmation Health subgroup. I apologise that I'm not on camera. My technology seems to have failed me this evening. So uh, unfortunately, you'll only see slide presentation from me and not my uh, smiling face. Uh, it's great to have so many people joining us this evening. Uh, do need to let you know that the webinar is being recorded and it will be available on the Kennel Club's YouTube channel uh, shortly after uh, we've finished editing the webinar. So please do look out for the link to the YouTube channel. Uh, we've had a number of questions already submitted from people. There's a few uh, questions there that hopefully will be answered during the course of the presentations. Uh, any that we haven't covered in the presentations, we will pick up as a specific Q&A session at the end of this evening. And uh, you should all find a Q&A button on your copy of Teams if you'd like to ask anything in the course of the presentation. If there are topics that uh, occur that you'd like to further ask, please drop those into the Q&A this evening. Uh, we've got about 20 minutes to do questions at the end of the session this evening. So we will pick up as many of the pre-submitted questions as we can, and we will pick up as many of the questions that you drop into the chat as we can this evening. In terms of the uh, session this evening, first 10 minutes, just a little bit of uh, introduction from me talking about the rise of popularity of uh, so-called fashionable colours with a particular focus on the Dachshunds. Uh, I'm then going to hand over to uh, Dr. Rosario Cherundolo from Dick White Referrals. Uh, Dick will, uh, Rosario will be talking about colour dilution alopecia, the condition, about its diagnosis, symptoms and treatment. Uh, then we'll hand over to Dr. Joanna Ilska, who's the Kennel Club's Head of Genetics, and she will talk about uh, inbreeding, autoimmune conditions, in addition to the genetics of dilute coat colours. I'll wrap up uh, after Joanna's presentation, talk a little bit about where we're going from a, an education and awareness perspective at the Kennel Club, and then we'll move into the final Q&A session of the webinar this evening. So we have two fantastic speakers for you today. Uh, Dr. Rosario Cherundolo, uh, as I said, Head of uh, Dermatology at Dick White Referrals. Some of you may have heard him speak at uh, previous Kennel Club sessions, so I'm sure you get a lot out of his presentation tonight. And Dr. Joanna Rilska, again, some of you may have attended the Kennel Club's Health Symposium last year. Joanna was one of our key speakers at that session. So those are our two presenters for this evening. Just want to talk a little bit about uh, some of the background and context to why we're running this webinar this evening. So a little bit about the rising popularity of fashionable colours and some of the trends associated with registration data. I, I wasn't able to pull together the data for 2022 registrations, but 2021 registrations. This shows the number of dogs registered in 2021 for breeds where there are non-breed standard colours in the registration lists. And there's about 24 breeds that do have non-breed standard colours. And you can see that there's quite a variation in terms of the proportion of NBS colours compared with total registration. So the French Bulldogs particularly have a very high proportion, something like 30 odd thousand uh, registrations that are non-breed standard compared with the total registrations there of uh, around 55,000. And then if you look at something like the Labrador Retrievers, huge numbers of registrations, 60,000 registrations, uh, relatively small number of non-breed standard, but in a population that size, it's still a significant number of dogs that are non-breed standard colors. And further down on the list, uh, we have Dachshund uh, Miniature Smooths uh, with their registrations and non-breed standard and Dachshund Miniature Long, which are also on the list there with a smaller number of registrations and a few non-breed standard uh, colours registered as well. I did pull out the data for uh, the six varieties of Dachshund pre-2018, 2018, 2019, uh, through to last year's registrations. And 
These are particularly for the dilute colors, which are blue and Isabella. Uh, so those are the two main dilute colors that we find in the Dachshunds and rather striking to see the proportion of miniature smooth Dachshunds in 2022, 20%, one in five of miniature smooth Dachshunds were blue or Isabella. So a really concerning trend uh, in terms of those dilute colors in, in, the, in, the, in the breed. Uh, a rise also with the miniature longs in 2022 uh, and to some extent in the smooths and the longs, but uh, mini smooths is clearly the variety where we have the biggest concern. And we need to see this uh, color dilution alopecia in context. This is some data from three of our breed health surveys in the Dachshunds. We ran breed surveys in 2012, 2015 and 2018. And actually skin diseases and allergies were the second highest uh, uh, prevalence of condition. Color dilution, color dilution alopecia appears well down the list as a, uh, an overall prevalence in our varieties. And just picking up on our 2021 Dachshund breed survey, where we had just under 10,000 responses, the overall prevalence of color dilution alopecia there was just under one and a half percent. And that compared with the prevalence in our 2018 survey of 0.4 percent. We also found that uh, amongst the Dachshunds, 30 percent of the blue Dachshunds were affected with color dilution alopecia and 12 percent of the Isabellas. So uh, you're talking about 70 percent of blues that didn't uh, uh, suffer from the condition and 88% of the Isabellas that didn't suffer from color dilution alopecia. So that's some of the background and context to this evening's webinar. I'm going to hand over now to Rosario. I'll stop my screen share and Rosario will share his slides with you. Thank you, Ian, for your introduction. Can you see the full um, slide, the full screen? Yes, we can see that. Okay, great, thank you. Um, well, good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm very honored that I was asked to talk on this topic and I'm very grateful and I would like to thank the Kennel Club for inviting me um, to this evening uh, webinar. Um, I have a special interest on this uh, condition and um, as you will see I've been studying this condition in one particular breed but I do see the color dilution alopecia in so many breeds. Um, the color dilution alopecia it's part of a group of conditions that in uh, veterinary medicine dermatologists will group under the umbrella of follicular dysplasia, which means that the hair follicle is somehow abnormal. And so we have probably four kind of groups of subgroup that we can recognize. One is the color dilution alopecia, a second one, which is the black hair follicular dysplasia, which some, somehow is very similar. And I'll show you some example. And then I would like to mention the Weimaraner, which is a breed which is quite unique. It, it is a fascinating to see how the hair shaft in this breed resemble those of the diluted um, dogs, but some of them have problem and some have not. And then I will finish talking about follicular lipidosis, which is a condition that again affects the hair shaft. Um, which has been described in Rottweiler, but very recently there was a paper that uh, reported this condition in the Dachshund. Uh, clinically looks very similar, but I, I thought I would mention, because I really would like to know from you guys if there is anyone in the audience that has probably heard or had a dog with this condition. 
I have just one slide where I would like to mention the genetic, but then the next speaker, uh, it's a much more experienced and knowledgeable person than me to tell you about genetics. So I just want to say that this color dilution alopecia, it's a disease which is recessive in many breeds. Um, and then the dilution type of color occur also in not just in dogs, but also in other animal species. Uh, what really happened, and I will explain to you with the picture later on, is that there is uh, an abnormal transfer of the pigment that uh, it's normally produced by some cells called the melanocytes, which are the one that produce the melanin that makes us tan when we are on the beach for some time. And so we get that nice tan color. But that type of pigment, which should normally be um, diffused evenly in the skin within the hair follicle, uh, gets all clumped, clumped up and then there are abnormality in, within the skin and within the hair shaft. And we call those big clumps macromelanosomes. I'll show you some picture and so it will be easier for you to understand what I mean. Um, color dilution alopecia has been reported in a number of breeds. So the dachshund is not the only one. I'm afraid there are so many other breeds. I'll show you some example of dogs that I've seen, some that have been reported in the literature. Um, the clinical presentation, it's very similar among breeds. There is a progressive hair loss. So dogs will show sparse coat and eventually they may become completely bald, which only affect the diluted part of the body or the whole body if they have just one color. The age of onset of this condition vary from breed to breed. That's what I found. Uh, for example, in Yorkshire Terrier may start as early as six months. In other breed, perhaps in the Dachshund, may start later, around one or two years of age. But then, of course, that depends how quickly the owner or the breeder will spot the signs of a sparsening of the uh, coat. What is unfortunately annoying is that uh, it's not just the boldness that concern owners, breeders, and the vets. It's also that these animals are frequently predisposed to bacterial infection, which make us uh, to consider the possibility of the treatment. And I'll show you in my next slides which option nowadays I would prefer. Um, this condition has been recognized a long time ago. Uh, you can see that in this paper that was published in 1986, uh, there was uh, um, a description of an Italian greyhound. Um, it's not the dog that was reported in the literature, but just to show you how it looks like a blue Italian greyhound. And, and so that's the first time that we dermatologists became aware about uh, this condition and we learn probably about the coat color, uh, which sometimes uh, it's something that breeders are more experienced than us. And actually they come to us and say, okay, this is such a color. Uh, then later on, there was another paper that was published uh, in the States again, uh, where they described this condition in, uh, in Doberman. Uh, the picture from the publication are not great, but you can see here on the left side, I don't know if you can see the arrow, but on the left side, you can see the trunk of this dog is completely bald. And then you can see all these pimples, which means that the hair follicle become infected. It looks like a person with acne, but these are actually all the places where the hair shaft should have come through that became infected. Um, and the next slide show a Doberman, which I've seen, and you can see how sparse is the coat. There are even some white spot that seems to develop later on. Uh, so there is very few hairs uh, left. And then there was a time when I was working in Italy at the University of Naples, where I graduated many years ago, where we suddenly so a lot of Yorkshire Terrier with this condition to the point that we put together all these cases and uh, published the uh, results of our study. At the time, Yorkie were very popular or fashionable breed. Um, 
for many reasons. And, and so we were presented with dogs that you can see, they show a normal long coat on the face, on the limbs, and then the rest of the trunk, which is the coat color that is affected, they show almost no hair left. And then I'll show you some of the results from this study in the next few slides. Uh, just to show you uh, the other publication that came through the li literature. Uh, finally, the year later, we published that uh, paper in Yorkie. Then someone from Belgium published a good series of uh, um, Dachshund with um, this condition. And they again showed similar changes to the one that we described. So the uh, microscopical changes affecting the hair shaft and the abnormality that they saw on electron microscopy are very similar to the one that we described. And here are some examples of Dachshund which I've seen during the last several months years. So you can see this very cute dog that show almost no hair left on the trunk. Uh, that's a close view and you can see how sparse is. And then this particular dachshund, which was referred to our hospital for a neurological problem, that's the reason why it's not standing, but look how severely it was affected. They even lost the hair on the head. There are only a few tufts of hair on the forehead, probably on the lower limbs. And then when you look at the uh, close view, you can see that the hair is definitely not normal. It's very short because it's easily broken. And I'll tell you why this happened. And then you can see that uh, uh, other breeds like Chow, uh, Chihuahua um, show very short coat. This one has got major hair loss on, along the spine, hair loss on the tail. And then I've seen this condition in Russian Terrier. You can see the limbs were almost bald, the tail, the head. And then I wanted to tell you about another breed, which for some reason show very identical uh, clinical presentation and uh, microscopical finding, which is the silver Labrador. Uh, this again came up from the US where colleagues have been putting together a good number of cases uh, and soon there will be a proper publication about this condition. Uh, funny enough, two months ago, I saw two silver Labrador, uh, which belongs to the same owner. And one of them is in these uh, photographs. And you can see that uh, there is major uh, truncal uh, hair loss. And these were dogs that were prone to infection. That was the reason of the referral to uh, our hospital. Uh, and then eventually I explained that the bacterial infection is unfortunately a common um, findings in dogs with diluted uh, color when they lose the hair. Um, I told you at the beginning that uh, um, dogs uh, um, with black hair, they may be affected by a condition which only affects the black spot of the area. And we call this condition black hair follicular dysplasia. And there are a number of breeds that can be affected. Um, Initially, they have a normal coat, but eventually they start to lose the hair just in the black area. And this has been recognized even in the 1970s, as you can see from this uh, publication. I think the best example of dog that I saw was this Dalmatian, which from a distance, you may not probably appreciate the alopecia, but when, when you look at the um, black poire, as the French people call uh, the dots, uh, the black fur is gone. Uh, so this dog had patchy area, which looks like ringworm, but it's not. This dog was just missing the black hair and the white fur was completely normal. The next one was another example uh, from a distance, maybe hard probably to appreciate the hair loss in the black area. But then this is a close view of the left side that show how the black area was completely affected. So what is happening in these uh, black area or what is happening in the color uh, dilution alopecia. There are abnormality when we look at the hair shaft. Trichogram is a word that we use when we pull some of the hair from the animal body 
put on the slides and look under the microscope. That's the first test that people with a microscope, pets will normally do, because that will show that there are hair shaft abnormality, perhaps even fractured, that eventually will lead to alopecia. And what I normally see will be all these big clumps, all these dots that should not be there. Normally, a hair shaft from any other breed, a normal dog, will have finally tiny dot uh, here. Um, which will uh, um, eventually uh, show the normal pigmentation. But when we see these large clumps of melanin, that's definitely abnormal. That's what we see in color dilution alopecia, in black hair follicular dysplasia. And then what we did, we put this hair under the scanning electron microscopy. And we found that when these large clumps of pigment will drop off from the hair shaft, then there will be a hole, what we call the crater. And then there will be one here, one here, one here. And then this make the hair shaft very weak, fragile. And then there will be a fracture. And that's the place where the hair will break and fall off. And here are more pictures, um, the one that I show from my study, and these are the one from another study that was published. And you can see all these holes. It's like a Swiss cheese. And then all the holes will make the hair very fragile. And here is a close view of the picture that show how the hair eventually got uh, um, fractured and fall off. So, most of the time, the trichogram, the examination of the hair shaft is enough, but sometimes if we want to go further and perhaps we need some kind of documentation for a breeder purpose or for other reason, then we will do a skin biopsy. So the skin biopsy means that with a tool, a very sharp uh, pen, um, we take a piece of skin, diameter of uh, six millimeters, so really tiny, with local anesthetic or with sedation if needed. And then we send to the pathologist. So I'll show you the histopathology, which may be probably difficult for you to uh, understand, but let me guide you through the uh, photograph. Um, this is a slice of the skin, and you can see on the top the dandruff, and then this is the what we call the skin, and this whitish pink part it's the structure which is below the skin where the hair follicle come through and so you can see that there are quite a lot of black spots in the skin that's the reason why the skin becomes darker and then there are a lot of these black spots within the hair follicle and that's what causes all the damage to the hair shaft that's a, an enlarged picture. So normally we would not see all these black dots within the hair follicle. So that's a confirmation that the pathologist will write, yes, this is a color dilution alopecia of black hair follicular dysplasia. Now, many of you have asked the question, okay, what we can do to treat this condition? Well, I'm afraid there is no cure. There is nothing that we can do because it's a genetic disease. But what we can do is to make this dog slightly better because we can control, prevent secondary bacterial infection. And nowadays that you, I'm sure you have heard about the abuse of antibiotic that human doctor and veterinarian have done throughout the past years. Nowadays, we don't want to use oral antibiotic, injectable antibiotic. We just want to use antiseptic. So product like the one that I have here in the picture are the one that I would normally recommend. You can see that I show a solution, a foam, because it can be gently applied on the body surface. I would not recommend recommend a shampoo because the more you shampoo, the more you break the hair when you try to leather the shampoo onto the body. So you want to gently apply an antiseptic so we'll control, treat the infection. And then if you really want to do something more, Melatonin is the one that has been recommended. Melatonin is the type of medication that we also take when we fly over the pond and go to the States to adjust our body clock to the, um, to the different time zone. But melatonin has got so many other important functions. It would interfere with the hormonal receptor at the level of the skin, the hair follicles, would kick in the hair cycling. It's a kind of tiny fertilizer, if I can use this 
um, analogy. And then also will control the secretion of the prolactin. Prolactin is the hormone that pro induces the lactation. And that's the reason why bitches lose always the coat and then eventually will regain the coat when the prolactin drops down. So basically you um, stop the production of the prolactin and somehow the hair may regrow. I don't have many pictures because I never bothered to take picture post treatment, but this was just an example of a dog that show how in September 18, and then by March, there was an unacceptable hair regrowth. The hair, of course, was still affected. It was very fragile. The owner had not been shampooing at all the dog. Um, otherwise, the hair would have fallen off again. Um, so that's a little help that can be uh, done. I told you that Weimaraner is a very interesting breed because normal Weimaraner would have... Uh, these tiny clumps of melanin in the hair shaft, if you look under the microscope. Uh, but then a group of French dermatologists found that there is a subgroup of Weimaraner which are actually affected by a condition which is very similar to the color dilution alopecia, black hair follicular dysplasia. And they found that dogs eventually will develop a very sparse coat, alopecia, spotted depigmentation of the skin. And this happened in dogs between one and three years of age and eventually can affect the old trunk. Um, and here again, there are recurrent bacterial skin infection. That's what folliculitis means. The picture that they published are very similar. You can see the black dots, um, the arrow is here, the black dots along the hair shaft when it's looked under the microscope, the type of crater which are along the hair shaft. Imagine that the hair shaft is like the roof of your house with slates. And then at some point, one slate break, and then something comes out. And oh, there is a hole. And then eventually we'll get water in your loft because uh, that's what happened. There is a hole. So it's a very fragile spot. And eventually the hair will break. Then they looked at the uh, hair shaft of normal dogs um, and dogs uh, um, that were affected, but they looked at normal area. Uh, they looked also at affected area and they found that affected dogs in affected area, they have more large and numerous clumps of melanin. So there is a subset of women runner that do have a condition. Um, which is very likely genetic based on the study that they did. They also did electron microscopy and they found the type of abnormality that I just showed you. Uh, lastly, the um, follicular lipidosis. This is a condition that has been now reported in Rottweiler for uh, some time. Um, Rottweiler are not a very popular breed. I can't remember now how common is in the UK from the list that Ian showed. But time to time, I see Rottweiler. And very rarely, I've seen this uh, uh, lack of hair in the Mogany area, while the black area is uh, normal. So these are pictures that were given to me by a colleague from Belgium. And this, again, is the Rottweiler showing on the muzzle uh, the lack of uh, hair, uh, which is on both sides of the uh, muzzle. Here again, there are abnormality of the hair shaft that make the um, hair become very fragile and then eventually will break. Now, something similar to the Rottweiler has been recently um, described five years ago uh, by a group of uh, vets from uh, Brazil. Um, I've not seen any other report in the literature, but I would be interested if any of you has uh, heard or has had a dog with this condition. Um, so these were, um, this was just one dog, uh, which was pretty young, as you can see. Um, uh, he, he was 13 months old, was a female, that was presented with this uh, lack of hair or very short hair, that's what hypotrichosis means, on the head, on the neck, which had started very early in life, around 10 months of age. And this is the picture of the uh, dog. Um, I've not seen any of these cases. Uh, Daxon 
are still quite common because we do see a lot of them either through neurology uh, department, unfortunately, because they have a lot of back problem or they come to me because they have allergic problem, which is also another common condition as Ian um, mentioned. Uh, but I've not seen this particular condition. Well, I just wanted to give you an overview about this condition in different breed with a small focus on Dachshund. Uh, so I hope that was uh, not too difficult to follow, uh, but has been quite informative. Uh, unfortunately, up to today, we still don't have a definitive answer uh, why um, this condition uh, happen, uh, why the melanin gets all clumped up and builds into the hair shaft and within the skin, uh, something that may need probably a few more years of study and research, but who knows, one day perhaps we may be able to answer this question at some point in the future. So Ian, that's what I have from my clinical uh, and laboratory point of view. Uh, so I can stop sharing now my presentation and I can pass on to you uh, the microphone. Thank you very much, Rosario. Uh, very much appreciate your presentation and interesting to see uh, the examples and the, the evidence from breeds beyond the Dachshunds that I'm more familiar with. Uh, I've had a couple of text messages and messages to say that some people don't seem to have the Q&A functionality available to them. I suspect that might be because of the version of Teams that you're using or whether you have that, uh, whether you're in a browser. Uh, it is available in the window that my colleagues are seeing this evening. So hopefully some of you, if you are trying to submit questions, will be able to do that. And apologies to those of you who don't have that functionality. Uh, as I said, we did have a number of questions submitted beforehand and we will pick those up and make sure that they're addressed at the back end of the webinar this evening. So I'm going to hand over to Dr. Joanna Ilska now. Uh, Dr. Joanna Ilska is our genetics health manager at the Kennel Club. And uh, you can see that she has a Russian black terrier in the background, the photograph. Um, and she's now going to talk about the genetics of the dilute coat color and color dilution alopecia. So over to you, Joanna. Thank you. Thank you, Ian. Uh, can you just confirm that you can see the, the screen? I can see the shared screen. OK, perfect. Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, so I'll jump straight into my presentation. We're going to have uh, four parts. Uh, first, we're going to talk about the genetics of dilute coat color. Secondly, we'll review what is currently known about the genetics of CDA. And thirdly, we'll briefly touch on the dangers that are associated with breeding for fashion, uh, which are not necessarily linked uh, to color. Um, and we will conclude with breeding advice, uh, particularly in respect to dilutes and uh, CDA. Now, we don't really have that much time today, so I'm not going to uh, cover all the basics of how genetic variation arises. So if you're new to the world of genetics, I would uh, like to encourage you to watch our webinar on the science of DNA testing. Um, it explains exactly that how genetic variation is created, how is it inherited. Uh, the webinar focused on health traits. Uh, but the same rules apply when we talk about uh, coat colors, and you can find that webinar on our YouTube channel. So without further ado, let's jump into uh, genetics of dilute coat color. Um, the inheritance of the, of the dilute coat color has been actually well studied over the decades. Uh, for example, it has been described in the inheritance of coat color in dogs, uh, written by Clarence Little in 1950, so 70 years ago. Of course, at the time, it was impossible to actually look at the genes that dogs have. Uh, but uh, by observing different crosses, Clarence deduced that the coat color and pattern are determined by a number of different genes and their interactions. He referred to those suspected genes as loci, uh, a single locus, with the D locus that we'll be talking about today being responsible for coat color dilution. Uh, Clarence determined that the dilute coat color is recessive to the non-diluted coat color. So we will mark the dominant uh, non-diluted variant as a capital D and the, rec uh, the recessive uh, variant, which causes uh, color dilution as a small D. 
Now, each dog carries two copies uh, of each gene, uh, with one copy inherited from the sire and one inherited from the dam. So if a dog inherited two dominant non-diluted variants marked with two capital D letters, he is going to have a non-diluted coat color and he will only pass non-diluted variants to his offspring. So he's not going to produce uh, diluted puppies. If a dog has one variant associated with color dilution, but the other variant is normal, so one capital D, one small d, uh, he is still going to have a normal non-diluted coat color, but he has 50% chance of passing the dilute uh, variant to his offspring, so he may produce dilute puppies. A dog has to have two copies of the variant associated with coat color dilution, so small d, small d, uh, for the dilution to actually show in his coat. And this dog will pass the dilute variant to all of its offspring and uh, obviously may produce diluted puppies. So if we know what genetic variants parents have, we can predict what are the possible outcomes in the puppies. So to produce a visibly diluted puppies, both parents must be at the very least carriers of the dilution. Uh, we should remember that because the, of the recessive uh, nature of the variants responsible for cold, cold color dilution, it is actually impossible to know whether a dog carries dilution or is free from it just by looking at it. Uh, they are both the capital D, capital D, and the carrier dog will have a non-diluted cold color, so it will look exactly the same. Now, those rules outlined, uh, outlined by Clarence Little uh, still hold today. Um, however, of course, uh, with the advances in genetic knowledge, uh, uh, we now know more, far, far more detail. Um, so, for example, we know that the gene which is responsible for color dilution is actually called melanophilin, and it is associated with coat and hair color dilution in many species, including humans and mice. Uh, the first time it was described as involved in color dilution in dogs was in 2004, and since then, uh, three genetic variants within this gene have been described. Uh, on the right, uh, you have the titles of the key scientific articles uh, relating to identification of those variants, if you'd like more detail. So the first genetic variant labeled as D1 was identified in 2007, and it is very widely distributed across many unrelated breeds, as well as mongrels. Uh, this is the variant that causes the unique silver uh, color of Weimaraners, uh, as well as dilute Dachshunds, Dobermans, and many, many other breeds. And because it is so widely spread across seemingly unrelated breeds, uh, it likely first appeared before breeds started to separate uh, hundreds and hundreds of years ago. Uh, the second variant, labeled D2, uh, was diagnosed uh, 10 years later. Uh, this variant is considerably more rare, uh, and today, at least in scientific literature, it has been reported only in Chow Chows, uh, Slugi, and Thai Bridgeback, so breeds of Asian origin. In 2020, yet another variant, uh, labeled D3, was discovered, which determines they would color in a few uh, different breeds, uh, as well as being present in wolves. Uh, in many breeds where this variant is found, the first variant, the D1, is also present. So at this time, uh, we have three known genetic variants which are responsible for uh, dilute coat color in dogs, and they explain the vast majority of, the, uh, of those colors across all breeds. So thanks to the knowledge of those specific variants, uh, of course, uh, we have been, well, we have been, uh, the very clever people have been able to develop DNA tests uh, that we can now use uh, to differentiate between dogs that are free from the dilution and the carrier dogs. Uh, so majority of the DNA test providers offer the test for dilution. Uh, but not all of them will cover all three variants. Um, so if you have a breed like Chow Chow or Slugi or Italian Greyhounds and you'd like to uh, buy a uh, DNA test for dilution, it's worth double checking uh, that the, 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 the test that you're planning on buying actually covers all of the three known variants. So that was genetics of the dilute coat color per se. Now uh, let's uh, talk about uh, color uh, dilution alopecia. Um, historically, um, CDA has been reported uh, for the very uh, for, for the first time uh, many many de de decades ago, uh, and it, initially it was assumed that it is caused by a specific variant at the D locus. 
So um, a dog with two copies of the healthy D variant would only have the diluted coat color, whereas a dog uh, with the CDA related variant would have both diluted coat color and they would suffer from CDA. Um, but nowadays we know that this actually isn't likely to be the case. Firstly, over the last 15 uh, years, several groups of researchers across the world, both in Europe and America, uh, carried out multiple projects trying to find the CDA related variant on the D-locus, and unfortunately, all of them were unsuccessful. Secondly, many dogs, uh, both with and without CDA, have been genotyped as having two copies of the D1 uh, variant. So the dilute color of these dogs with CDA can be fully explained by the known variants. If they had a different CDA specific variant, we would expect at least some of them to show a different result. Thirdly, variation in the melanophyllin gene in other species uh, does not have any detrimental effects on health. This doesn't necessarily mean that it's impossible. Uh, dogs could indeed be an exception. Uh, but typically, when variation in some gene has harmful effect, it will have it across species. So based on the above, the current opinion among scientists is that it is very unlikely that the genetic variants which are responsible for CDA are located within the melanophyllin gene. Instead, uh, we suspect that genetic variant or variants uh, related to CDA uh, are in genes other than melanophyllin. So the diluted coat color determined by the melanophyllin gene is not sufficient to cause CDA. The dog also needs to have the genetic variants responsible for CDA. Um, now, unfortunately, not only we don't know which gene or genes are responsible for CDA, but we also don't know much about its mode of inheritance. So Rosario mentioned uh, earlier on that CDA was believed to be uh, autosomal recessive. And, and in fact, there is a paper um, that uh, performed a pedigree analysis in a, in a family of dachshund. Um, and based on that pedigree analysis, it looked like CDA is inherited as an autosomal recessive trait. But unfortunately, uh, what they actually tested for was the mode of inheritance of the dilute coat color rather than CDA. Um, so all of the blue uh, diluted dogs in that pedigree were affected. Uh, to truly examine the inheritance mode of CDA, uh, we would need to study a family of dogs where all dogs were dilute. Uh, but some of them were affected by CDA, while others are not. What we do know, however, is that the frequency of the gene variant or variants responsible for CDA differs between breeds. CDA is most often reported in dilute Dobermans and Dachshunds. Uh, for Dobermans, uh, I found the estimate of the prevalence uh, between 60 and 90 percent of diluted Dobermans being affected with CDA, and this was based on the data collected uh, in the 80s and early 90s in a vet hospital in the USA. Now, we should take into account that these estimates are 30 years old and they come from America, so they may be somewhat different to the prevalence among the UK uh, population of Dobermans. We just don't know. Uh, another source uh, for breed-specific prevalence comes from the Dax Life surveys uh, carried out by the Dachshund community in the UK, and Ian has mentioned them already in his introduction. In those two surveys, the prevalence of CDA ranged uh, for the little dogs between 43 and 81 percent. So on the other extreme, we have Weimaraners, which, according to scientific papers, very rarely suffer from uh, uh, CDA. Now, I found one more study which estimated that 25% of dilute colored dogs suffer from CDA, but unfortunately, the authors of that study didn't provide any information on the breeds uh, which these dogs belong to. So 25% is considerably lower than the prevalence that we have seen for Dobermans and Dachshunds. Um, so one has to assume that other breeds are less commonly affected than these two breeds. So to conclude, uh, the current knowledge tells us that ge genetic causes between CDA and d locus are different. We can use a DNA test for identifying carriers of dilute coat color, but unfortunately there is no DNA test for CDA. Uh, the diluted coat color is not sufficient to cause CDA, but it is a predisposing factor where the genetic variants for CDA already exist. 
and those genetic variants which cause CVA differ in frequency between different breeds. So we have focused on CVA as one of the risks associated with breeding for fashionable colors. But sometimes those risks are not uh, inherently linked to the color, but instead they are related to poor breeding practices. And whenever fashion enters dog breeding, it always spells a disaster. Uh, by definition, fashion or a fad uh, is based on, on very short-lived preferences and is frequently driven by impulse. And this is a problem because responsible dog breeding is never fast. So if someone breeds purely to meet the demands driven by fashion, uh, they will likely be tempted to cut some corners. So let's first talk about so-called rare collars, as rarity is currently one of the main selling points for fashion driven breeders. Uh, most of the rare collars are recessive. And we know now that with a recessive collar, both parents need to be at least carriers uh, to produce a puppy of that given collar. So if the collar is red, by definition, the carriers will also be red. So, for example, if we have one dog of a specific collar born in 10,000 dogs, then in that same population of 10,000 dogs, there will be less than 200 carriers. That means that even if we were to use DNA testing to identify those carriers, we would have to test huge numbers of dogs to actually find a carrier for breeding. So typically, uh, fashion-driven breeders will start their program, uh, breeding program with a dog which displays the color they are interested in. Uh, let's just say a, a green color. Um, they will likely breed this dog uh, to a dog which doesn't have the variants for green, and so they will produce a litter of puppies which are carriers. But then what? Uh, what is the fastest way for them to produce green puppies that they can sell without spending loads of money on getting another green dog, if they even exist? Well, the absolutely easiest way to maximize the chances of getting green puppies is, of course, through breeding of uh, related dogs. So a fashion driven breeder may decide to breed the full siblings or even breed one of the carrier puppies back to the green parent. And breeding related dogs will give a much higher chance of producing the green color as related dogs have higher chances of carrying the same genetic variants. But here is the catch. Related dogs have much higher chances of carrying the same genetic variants, whether they are related to color or disease. So by prioritizing the color, a fashion driven breeder increases the risks of producing puppies which are affected with a whole host of inherited diseases. These issues are not caused by the color of the dog per se, but they are caused by the poor breeding practices, which are driven by the desire to produce puppies of a given color as quickly as possible to meet the demand. Secondly, color is but one aspect of a dog. This becomes a problem if a fashion breed driven breeder has a dog of a specific uh, fashionable color, uh, but which also has a health problem, or maybe it has poor temperament. Uh, the responsible breeding decision in those circumstances would be to drop this dog from breeding and search for another dog which has both the color, temperament and health. Uh, but of course, this would require extra time and this uh, fashion driven breeder would not be able to meet the demand, which, as we said, is very short lived. Another risk relates to a so-called popular sire effect. If a fashionable color is truly unique, uh, then the first dog of this color is likely to be bred very extensively. That means that the genes that this dog carries, not only the ones that are related to the color, but also genes related to this health and temperament, will be spread far and wide. For example, if a dog of specific color had poor temperament, uh, it might be that many of his descendants will also have poor temperament, not because the temperament is intrinsically connected to the color, but because they inherited both the color and temperament from the same ancestor. Secondly, every individual has some harmful genetic mutations. This typically isn't an issue as long as no individual is uh, used too extensively. But if a dog is used disproportionately, he will also spread those harmful genetic mutations that were unique to him to a large number of offspring. And finally, uh, we need to be aware uh, that the world of social media has created fashion driven breeders who started with red and so called exotic colors, but they now have moved to other more extreme and exaggerated traits. Um, and I don't think I need to comment on the health issues and ethical issues associated with breeding for extremes. 
So all of the above risks are associated with poor breeding practices. They are not intrinsically related to coat color, but they go hand in hand with fashion driven breeding. And it is crucial that when we buy a puppy or when we decide to use a stud dog, we ensure that we support breeders who breed responsibly. So let's wrap this up with some breeding recommendations. <clears throat> uh, the Kennel Club encourages breeding only those dogs which display colors that are accepted within the breed standards. And there are several reasons for this. Firstly, the breed standard colors represent the heritage of the breed, uh, and so they are safer from the risks associated with fan breeding because they have been developed over decades or even centuries. There is no short term gain here. Secondly, because uh, breed standard colors are so well, well established within breeds, it is much easier to select for the truly important traits such as health and temperament, uh, even within the same coat color. Further, because these colors have been present in the breeds for decades, uh, breeders have the opportunity to breed out or at least reduce in frequency uh, the, um, the detrimental traits which may have been associated with those colors earlier on in the breed's uh, history. A good example here, potentially, is a uh, lack of CDA in uh, Weimar runners. Now, whether you decide to breed breed standard or non-breed standard colors, uh, the top priority for any dog breeding uh, should always be the health and temperament of the dog. Um, so uh, we would encourage you to perform all the breed relevant health testing uh, and you can find the details of the recommended health tests for your breed in our breeds A to Z guide. Uh, but don't stop there. Um, there are a number of conditions that we don't have a test for just yet, but they are important. So if we talk about dachshunds, uh, a good example here would be allergies. So make sure that the dogs you are planning on breeding are as healthy as you possibly can. But uh, make sure that you're not prioritizing color over conformation or temperament. Now, once we are sure that the dog has great health and temperament, uh, we can make decisions on color. If you follow the advice of the Kennel Club, the situation is, is fairly easy by a breed standard dog after breed standard parents. If there is a suspicion that a dog which is of breed standard color may be a carrier of a non-breed standard color, utilize DNA testing. Uh, if the dog comes back as a carrier, uh, make sure that you, the mate that you choose for breeding is not a carrier of the same color variant. Now, you may be tempted to remove the carriers from breeding altogether, but remember that in some cases, this could have catastrophic consequences on the genetic diversity in your breed, uh, depending on how frequent those carriers are. With the availability of DNA testing, it is possible to breed carriers of, let's say, dilute without producing diluted puppies. So this approach is much, much safer. You can still breed healthy and well-tempered carriers, and you are not reducing genetic diversity. If you do decide to breed for non-breed standard colors, uh, particularly the rare colors, uh, you should be extra careful about inbreeding. It may be harder to find unrelated dogs which carry the same color variant as the one that your dog has, but spending that time and effort uh, on, on, on searching out that mate rather than breeding your dog to a close relative is really worth it. And breeding can have disastrous consequences. Now, if we talk specifically about breeding dilute colored dogs and trying to avoid CDA, uh, the best way to do this is to breed fully adult. Um, so Rosario uh, mentioned that uh, CDA uh, typically appears between six, uh, six months and two years of, of age. So breed dogs that are older than two years old um, that are visibly dilute and which are not affected by CDA. When we are breeding dogs which are carriers of dilution, we cannot know whether those dogs have the genetic variants associated with CVA, as the dominant non-diluted variant will mask their potential effect. On the other hand, dogs which have diluted coat color do not have the protective effect of the non-dilute variant. As such, we would expect that if they had the variants associated with CVA, they would suffer from this condition. Now, because we don't know exactly whether CDA is caused by one or more genes, and we don't know exactly what its mode of inheritance, this approach is not a guarantee, but it is a way of minimizing the risks. And for those of our listeners who are not breeders, uh, but you fancy a, a fashionable color dog, first of all, make sure that you find a reputable breeder, a breeder with good ethic good record of responsible breeding practices. Make sure the breeder is not involved in breeding for exaggerations and they don't use close in breeding. 
Once you find the breeder, uh, look at their dogs through black and white filter. Would you be happy with their structure? Do they look fit and healthy? What are their temperaments like? Whether you buy a breed standard or non-breed standard collar dog, you should always ask uh, first for the healthiest results of the parents. And in the specific case of buying a dilute colored puppy, you can minimize the risk of getting a dog with CDA, C CDA sorry, if you buy puppy after parents that you have checked yourself are not affected by it. But uh, you should accept that there is no guarantee that your dog won't go bald. So finally, our overall conclusions uh, from me are, uh, the cold color dilution is a simple recessive trait and a DNA test can be used to detect carriers, which themselves can non, uh, have non-diluted cold color. Uh, the cold color, cold color dilution, as attractive as it may be visually, increases the risk of CDA in some breeds, uh, but the genetic basis of CDA is unfortunately currently unknown. Whether you consider breeding or buying a dilute color dog, it is important to remember that the health and the temperament of a dog should always be a priority. So, Thank you very much. I'll stop sharing now. And back to you, Ian. Joanna, thank you very much for that. Uh, I guess my conclusion from that is much as we'd like it to be simple, it isn't. Um, some really key messages there about uh, we can test for the dilution gene, but we can't test for color dilution alopecia. And I did have a question sent to me during your presentation, somebody asking whether there were tests for CDA. Uh, the answer to that clearly isn't. I had another question asking, is there a safe way to breed these dilute dogs in order to avoid color dilution alopecia? And I think uh, you've pretty much answered that in terms of using dogs that are mature uh, and that no history of color dilution alopecia. Is there anything else that you'd like to add just in terms of advice for people who do choose to breed those dogs? Uh, so, no, I think that we've, we've, we've covered everything. Um, we will have the Q&A session at the end. OK, so, okay. Aren't we? Yeah. <laughs> okay um, good. Thank you. And I, I did have another comment from somebody who sent me a message to say, uh, I wonder if it's possible also add that many of the big fashion driven breeders, they use artificial insemination. Uh, so, uh, there's, you know, that's another way in which they're potentially propagating some of the um, the, in, the inbreeding and the, the other issues that arise with, with those dogs. And certainly going back to our Dachshund surveys, those dilute dogs tended to have more other health issues, higher, de higher degree of autoimmune conditions, for example, which we know goes with high levels of, uh, of, of inbreeding. Okay, I'm just gonna uh, go back to screen sharing with my screen and wrap up with a few final slides and then we'll move into the Q&A session. Just bear with me a second. Can you see my screen, Joanna? Yes, I can. Great, thank you. So I just want to talk a little bit about uh, some of the recommendations from the Non-Breed Standard Colours Working Party. Many people on the webinar will be aware that uh, Frank Kane chaired a working party uh, that was looking at non-breed standard colours. We met with half a dozen breeds and listened to their concerns. Uh, there has been a report that was submitted to the board with a series of recommendations and we fed those recommendations and actions back to those breeds that we met with. Uh, there was also a press release recently, many of you will have seen that, if not you can find that in the media centre on the Kennel Club website. But I just want to pick up some of the specific recommendations that came out from the working party. We will be putting in place uh, a system, we're, we're, we're badging it as Colour Watch, which is an aid to communicating and educating on the importance of breed standard colours in order to promote and protect, as uh, Joanna said, the heritage uh, of, of those pedigree breeds. It's likely to follow the similar sort of approach to Breed Watch, uh, which again, many of you will be familiar with. Breed Watch focuses on visible health conditions that judges ought to be able to identify in the show ring. So uh, the focus of Colour Watch is about highlighting breeds 
where there are trends in color registrations that could be a concern. And if you remember back to my slide about the miniature smooth Dachshunds, clearly the trend in registrations to dilute colored Dachshunds would flag a serious concern uh, under, under color watch. Uh, we also recognize that for many of the canine coat colors and patterns, there is no causal link or it's poorly defined between color and health. So Color Watch is not really attempting to align its categories with health concerns. So it will be a separate process from the Breed Watch process. And those health matters, those visible points of concern will continue to be part of the Breed Watch uh, process and uh, captured within Breed Health and Conservation Plans, which the Kennel Club manages in partnership with breeds, breed clubs and breed councils. So the Colour Watch system is going to be based on a combination of the numbers of registrations of non-breed standard colours and also the percentage of registrations that were non-breed standard for a calendar year as published in the Breed Record Supplement. And at the moment, the working uh, approach is that there would be five categories ranging from breeds that have no non-breed standard colour registrations and again, if you remember back to my early chart uh, in the presentation, I think there's something like 24 breeds with non-breed standard, which means more than 90% of the breeds that the Kennel Club registers uh, at the moment would be category zero. And then that runs up to category four, which would be breeds where more than 30% uh, are registered with non-breed standard colours or more than uh, 1,000 non-breed standard registrations per year. And that uh, translates into some of these examples that I have on the right hand side of this slide. So category four breeds under Colour Watch would be the French Bulldog, the Bulldog, the Pug, the Miniature Smooth Haired Dachshund, which we specifically talked about tonight, and the Cocker Spaniel. And all other breeds that aren't in the NBS list would be in category zero. So that's the, uh, that's the analysis based on the 2021 registrations. The idea would be that we would be looking at registrations annually and we would uh, look at which category and therefore what communication and education would be appropriate for those different categories of breed. So the breeds categorization would be discussed with the breed councils and breed clubs based on that registration data and it would be an annual review process that we would put in place to work collaboratively with those breed club communities. Main focus, uh, as I say, really is to help with communications, help with education of buyers and of breeders, and to work in partnership with the breed clubs on both of those aspects. So I think that pretty much takes us to the end of the presentations for this evening. We're just about on time as far as the agenda is concerned. So I'm going to stop my screen share at this point and ask my fellow speakers if they'd like to go back on camera and then we'll move into the Q&A session and pick up some of the pre-submitted questions and the ones that we've picked up in the chat in the course of this evening. Should I start? Rosario, can I come to you please? There were a number of questions that you wanted to pick up on that you weren't able to uh, address your presentation. Would you like to uh, take over? Yes, Ian, thank you. Uh, there were a good number of questions, some of them very interesting because uh, um, also showed the confusion which is behind um, this alopecia condition. One of the questions was about if the food will be related with this condition. Well, definitely uh, there is no correlation at all. Um, raw diet or any type of commercial diet will not increase or decrease the, um, the uh, hair loss or hair regrowth. Um, some people may be really unlucky that they have a dachshund, for example, that has got CDA and also has got a food or an environmental allergy, but that's just probably bad luck. Uh, but there is no correlation between allergies and this type of alopecia. Um, I've answered about question about testing therapy, um, also about uh, um, 
shampoo therapy, which I would probably discourage because shampooing may break even more her shaft. So foam or spray would be a better option if there is a secondary bacterial infection. Again, uh, there were questions about the dog that are itchy. Uh, if they are itchy, probably they have an allergy because usually this type of alopecia um, is presenting without itchiness. Um, these dogs are otherwise healthy. They don't have any other internal problem or external problem apart from the predisposition to skin infection. Um, one more question was about uh, uh, seasonal alopecia, which is a completely different condition. Uh, it's also called canine recurrent flank alopecia, which I've seen in Dachshund, but is a completely different condition, uh, which presents with hair loss just on each side of the flank. Uh, again, it's another condition that we still don't understand why it's happening, or perhaps we have uh, some idea, hypothesis, uh, but has nothing to do with the color dilution alopecia. Um, unless there are uh, other questions, Ian, uh, um, from the chat box that uh, uh, may be worth answering that I have not covered, just let me know. Uh, Rosario, I wonder it might be just worth talking a little bit about how you treat these dogs when they come to your clinic. Well, first of all, I look at the skin and see if there is an infection or not. If there is an infection, we need to address the infection uh, because the infection may be frustrating, uh, because may contribute to the itchiness, um, may contribute to the hair loss. So first of all, deal with the infection. And as I uh, mentioned before, I will use solution to be spread over the body or foam. Um, very rarely I would use systemic antibiotic, uh, which I will leave only for those very severe cases. And perhaps sometimes maybe even worth uh, considering a swab to identify the type of uh, bacteria that are involved to be able to use the right antibiotic. We don't want to abuse an antibiotic, just picking up one from the shelf. That's what I normally do. And, and then I try to help or to, let's say, promote the hair regrowth uh, supplementing with melatonin, which is very safe. Dog can take melatonin twice daily. Very rarely I found that they may be slightly lethargic when they are on melatonin, but otherwise they will tolerate very well. There are no stomach or gastrointestinal problem. Unfortunately, these are the only uh, way that we can help um, dogs with this uh, color dilution alopecia. Um, there is nothing else we can do. Okay, that's really helpful. Again, can I just ask a, a personal question in terms of uh, when people they take their dogs to first opinion vets, what sort of um, responses do you find that owners are getting from first opinion veterinary practices? How good are they at recognizing that maybe the dog does need a referral to somebody like yourself? Uh, I found that uh, colleagues in practice sometimes don't have the time because they are really busy um, to pull some of the hair, look under the microscope, um, find the abnormal clumps of melanin. Um, they may not be aware that uh, uh, this condition exists. So I, I did get these cases referred time to time. Um, there may be probably plenty more of cases out there that colleagues in practice um, are trying to diagnose and managing. Um, well, I think the first step will be to make sure that uh, um, the local vet uh, use the microscope, look at the hair shaft, uh, and then if the hair shaft have abnormality and the dog clinically show signs, two things match and a diagnosis can be of CDA can be suspected. And then of course, skin biopsy can be done to confirm the condition. Thank you. Joanna, can I come to you now? There's a number of questions. Um, I think there was a, a theme around the research that's going on into the genetics. Could you just say what's the, what's the, 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 the current focus in terms of research as far as color dilution alopecia is concerned? So unfortunately, I, I, I don't have any 
uh, promises. I have been in touch with one of the uh, top scientists uh, that has uh, has been involved in majority of the studies that we've discussed today, and he has told me that um, they are losing heart a little bit uh, because everyone was convinced that the CDA related variants will be within the melanopenin within the delocus. And they, they studied it back and forth and they just couldn't find anything. Um, they have looked at uh, one other gene uh, that was coming up as a candidate uh, from, from human studies, actually, uh, but that didn't uh, come up with anything either. So at this time, I'm not aware of any uh, projects that are currently running. Now, the good thing is that um, with, the, with, with genetic studies at the moment, uh, Geneticists are able to uh, read, let's say, the genome of the dogs, that read the DNA and store that in an electronic format. So they have all that data in their uh, in their databases. And um, there is a lot of co collaboration between different organizations, um, specifically Europe and, and, and uh, USA. Um, so hopefully whenever there is a breakthrough, they will be able to collate all that data that they have generated to date. Uh, but at this moment, I'm not aware of anything uh, running right now, unfortunately. Thank you. And the whole genetics of understanding colour is a, a, a topic area that is changing quite rapidly. Uh, there's some interesting papers over the last couple of years around uh, the genetics of colours, other colours in, in, uh, in, in dogs as well. If I can pick up some of the other questions, uh, does breeding of dilute to dilute increase the risk of colour dilution alopecia? So uh, now, as we discussed, this this might be actually the best way of of breeding away from CDA, um, and this is for well, first of all, uh, a dog can only ever have two copies of of uh, a gene. Um, so even if the parents both were diluted, um, so they both had small d small d uh, result, uh, they are still going to pass one copy each to the puppy. So the puppies are. Uh, genotype or the, 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 the copies that the puppy is going to have is still going to be just two. Uh, so now breeding dilute to dilute that does not increase the risk of CDA. Uh, what could increase the risk of, of CDA or any other condition is if those dilute parents are related. Um, and in those circumstances, we are getting back again to the poor breeding practices. Uh, but purely, if we take two completely unrelated two uh, dilute dogs, um, there is currently no reason to suspect that this could increase the, the risks of CDA. Thank you. And there was a sort of similar question about can non dilute puppies inherit color dilution alopecia? from the sire or the dam? Well, this is this is a really interesting question. And um, yeah, well, first of all, we need to um, consider that in, in the two contexts. So we have the genes responsible for, for the dilution, so the melanophyllin, and then we have gene or genes responsible for CDA. Um, so if the parents have the genetic variants uh, that are associated with CDA, then they they are likely to pass those to their offspring. So this puppy will likely have the genes responsible for CDA and potentially pass them again to his offspring. Uh, but as long as he's non-dilute, we would not typically expect him to develop CDA uh, because the, the, the dominant non-dilute uh, variant is going to have a protective effect. Uh, I am saying typically because we don't really understand it exactly. Uh, we have some reports of CDA in non-diluted dogs. Uh, for example, in the Dax Life survey, 5% of the non-diluted dogs were reported to suffer from CDA. We don't know whether that was a, a bit of a mistake in the diagnosis, maybe mislabeling of the color, but that result was there. Um, then also we have had about black hair follicular dysplasia, and we don't know anything about genetics of, of, of that disease. And as Rosario mentioned, uh, clinically, those two conditions are very, very similar. So perhaps uh, the genes that are causing CDA in diluted dogs can also can cause uh, black hair follicular dysplasia, but it's rare for whatever reason. So unfortunately, we, we, we don't... Uh, we don't know what uh, what the output uh, outcome would be. Typically, we wouldn't expect the puppy, non dilute puppy, to suffer from CDA. But again, he could pass this to to his uh, offspring in the future. 
Thank you. I think that's an important point about that DAX Life survey. There are probably some anomalies in terms of uh, data that was reported there. Uh, we did find, I think it was something like 70 times more likely for the dilute Daxons or the blue Daxons to have color dilution alopecia. You do wonder whether um, the diagnosis was correct for the non-dilutes, actually that, condi that condition there. Um, I want to move on, Joanna, to uh, a few questions that were probably directed more to me to, to answer on behalf of the, uh, the health group. Uh, one question was around uh, what is the Kennel Club doing to discourage uh, the breeding of rare colours? I've already mentioned uh, the working party, the Non-Breed Standard Colours Working Party. Uh, I encourage you to please read the press release on the uh, recommendations from that group, which you can find in the media center on the Kennel Club website. Uh, talked about the color watch system that is being developed at the moment and uh, work is in hand to implement that uh, over the course of this year. Uh, there's a load of work going on around the registration system as part of the Kennel Club's strategic review and we're looking at ways to make it much more effective in terms of promoting well-bred puppies with breed standard colours and relevant health tests. Uh, we've also made a number of changes to breed standards and again uh, those have been published in the breed record supplement and on the Kennel Club's website and there was a statement from the board last month with advice for judges on uh, which dogs should or should not be awarded if colours were or if aspects of the breed standard were highly uh, undesirable. I've got another question which is around why are the Kennel Club registering dilute dogs at all? And Joanne has already explained that while colour is a predisposing factor for colour dilution and alopecia, the two traits aren't irre irrevocably linked. So the evidence really doesn't support the view that other health conditions are directly caused by the coat colour. The evidence that uh, Joanne has presented this evening was reviewed by the veterinary and the genetic specialists on the Kennel Club's genetics and health screening uh, health group. They recommended that we should adopt an educational approach, hence the webinar this evening. Uh, and their view was that education was a much more inclusive way of tackling this, this issue rather than putting a ban on registrations. I think the reality is, uh, even if those registrations were banned, the breeding of those dogs would continue and we would then have no way of reaching out to those breeders or those potential buyers of dilute dogs. So I think that's the rationale for uh, continuing to try and be inclusive and to take an educational approach to it. My final question I'm going to pick up for this evening, uh, somebody asked, what can we do to raise awareness? And specifically, what is the Kennel Club doing to raise awareness? Uh, this evening's webinar is part of that process. The Colour Watch system that we're implementing is uh, a further element of that process to raise awareness. Uh, information will be on the website for buyers and uh, associated with breed standards on the website. Several breed club communities are already producing some excellent educational materials. And if anybody was at Discover Dogs, you'll have seen some really fantastic posters uh, from the various breed club communities. And those are on their websites as well. Clearly there is a role for breed clubs and breed councils as well as the cattle club. And if breed clubs are serious about protecting the health of their breed, they really do need to be very proactive on social media. I know from uh, the Daxon community, there are dozens of Facebook groups and uh, we try and work hard to try and engage with people in those groups and provide education uh, to those people. It is a massive task though, but we really do need to have cooperation and support from the breed clubs to do that. So I think in, in conclusion, uh, the Kennel Club would of course be really pleased to collaborate with breed clubs and any breed club charities on joint campaigns to help raise awareness and to educate either potential buyers or existing owners and potential breeders. One simple step would be to ask those of you that are on breed club committees, please would you share the links to this webinar and to other Kennel Club resources uh, from our YouTube channel 
and from our website after the webinar. So with that, I think I'm going to wrap up this evening's presentations. I'd like to thank again, Rosario and Joanna for your presentations. We will be editing the, 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 the webinar so that we've got it on the YouTube channel. I'm not quite sure what the timing will be for that. Uh, I apologize that some people have not been able to use the Q&A. Uh, I suspect that's a function of the browser that you are using this evening. Uh, apologies that you've not been able to do that. And thank you to the people who sent me WhatsApp messages and text messages and Facebook messages. I've been trying to catch up with as many of those uh, and multitasking as we go through this. And apologies that my, well, maybe it's not an apology. My camera didn't work this evening. You either had the joy of not seeing me or the disappointment of not seeing me. So uh, with that, I'm going to say thank you again to Joanna and Rosario and also to the rest of the health team at the Kennel Club uh, Fern and Poppy and Hannah, who've been working away in the background to make this uh, webinar happen this evening. Good evening, everybody. Thank you very much for your participation. <laughs>